Well, good morning again. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you did not bring your Bible with you this morning, feel free to use the one in front of you as we follow along. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to start reading this morning in verse number 11. I've entitled the message here this morning, A Ministry Marked by Integrity. A Ministry Marked by Integrity. If you found your place here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11, I'd invite you to please stand with me to honor God's Word as we read. The Bible tells us this, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not what is in the heart. Verse 13, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who, for their sake, died and was raised. Now, just a few more verses. Verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let's stop there for today and let's pray again. Uh, Lord, again, we're coming to you. Uh, thanking you for giving us a chance to be here this morning and to learn and uh, Lord, I am thankful that uh, this morning is not dependent upon me or my ability to deliver a message, but rather we just see over and over in Scripture that it's your Spirit that speaks to us and imparts us divine truth. Uh, Lord, thank you for that. That It's just so alleviating to know that you speak through your Word, and uh, I pray you would do that this morning. I also pray, Lord, knowing that as the gospel seed is is broadcast as it is sowed. Well, I know the enemy is there waiting like birds to pick up that seed and so it wouldn't, won't take root and, and grow. Uh, Lord, as we talk about ministries, Lord, as we talk about, uh, about the atonement, about how you died, as we talk about gossip, all these topics this morning, Lord, if there's anything in our hearts or in our lives that are out of whack, that are just, we're headed in the wrong direction. I pray you would reveal that to us and, and give us the power through your Spirit to turn away from that and to turn to you and rely on you for change. Uh, Lord, all these things I'm asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, church family, you can be seated. There are certain qualities within a spiritual leader that are non-negotiable. <laughs> you can't not have these things in order to be a spiritual leader. We see a lot of those in 1 Timothy 3, Sam and Titus. Uh, a lot of different passages talk about the characteristics and the qualities of a spiritual leader. And uh, I, like, I like reading about good, holy men who lead. I love to do that because that's, that's what I want to be. I, I have a lot of room to grow in that. And I come across something a few years ago by one of my favorite preachers uh, where he had listed out 11 essential qualities of, 11 essential biblical qualities of a godly leader. And Mr. Clint will eventually, he'll hit it and it'll go to a slide. And so these aren't, these aren't original to me. The, I didn't just come up with these. Uh, but I want to explain them. And the reason why I want to explain these qualities of a good leader is because I, I feel as though this guy left one out. And the one he left out is the one we're going to talk about in the passage here this morning. But if you're here this morning, I'm going to go through these really, really quick. If you're here and you're a pastor or you're a Sunday school teacher or maybe you're a dad 
or you're a grandpa, or you play a role of a spiritual leader within other people's lives, these are qualities that biblically should be in, in your life. The first one is leaders that make an impact are focused. Have you ever noticed that a good biblical leader is focused? He has a clearly defined mission. Uh, and it's, a, it's an essential quality for a good leader. A leader with no direction is not a leader at all. He's a follower. But number one, a good biblical leader is focused. Number two, I told you I was going to go fast. The second one is leaders who make an impact are internally motivated. They don't have to have somebody else coming along and say, hey, you need to go do this, you need to go do that. No, they don't need external factors to line up in order for them to achieve something. They are go-getters. They, they're initiators. So if you're a dad, like that's something that should be in your life. <laughs> you should be one who is internally motivated. Your wife shouldn't have to tell you to lead family worship. Your wife shouldn't tell you to do this or that. Good spiritual leaders don't make excuses. They make moves. They're always heading in a direction. Number three, good spiritual leaders who make an impact are also courageous. We just talked about a mission. Well, here it is. A good spiritual leader is courageous. Whenever they have a mission, whenever they have a task, they don't allow other things to scare them off of that task. They refuse to back down in adversity. Uh, when the situation gets hard, they don't just say, well, maybe we'll try again another day. No, they're, they're focused and they're courageous no matter the obstacle or hindrance. Number four, and again, this is on the screen, <coughs> leaders who succeed are knowledgeable. Uh, they know what they believe. They know what they need to know, and they're sure of what they believe. But not only that, a good spiritual leader doesn't come to a place in their life where they think they've arrived. They're always eager to learn more. Have you guys seen that in a good spiritual leader? They're always wanting to learn. Number five, Leaders who make an impact are also strong. They have the strength to endure difficult situations. Whatever the demands, they're strong. Number six, for leaders to have an impact, they also need to be optimistic. A good spiritual leader sees the good in their people. They always think favorably about other people. So when something comes up, they're always thinking, well, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. A good spiritual leader does that. With his children, with his church members, with the people in his Sunday school class, they're always thinking better about the other person. Number seven, they're enthusiastic. They're persuasive. They, a good spiritual leader generates contagious excitement about the mission. So much so that other people are willing to buy in and serve in that mission. It's a good mark of a spiritual leader. They enlist support of others. Number eight, effective leaders are willing to take risk. They put everything on the line for what they believe. They'll go to the wall on their convictions. Number nine, Leaders who make an impact are also skillful communicators. They're, they are able to articulate their vision, their idea, their mission in such a way that other people are motivated to buy in. Number 10, leaders who make an impact are imaginative. What I mean by that is they don't just watch what other people are doing and then follow. No, they're not content with the status quo. They don't want to just do what everybody else is doing. They have high aspirations. They come up with new ideas. A spiritual leader does those things. And number 11, I believe I included this. Yeah, they're independent in a lot of ways. A good spiritual leader is, which means when the bullets start flying, they're willing to stand even if nobody else will stand with them. A good spiritual leader is willing to do that. Now, those are really good characteristics of a spiritual leader. And I respect the man who come up with those. 
but I feel like he left one out. So we're going to add another one in that we see in this passage this morning. A good spiritual leader that makes an impact must also have integrity. I mean, integrity is the thing that holds all these other things together. If a spiritual leader doesn't have integrity, then he's, he's fake. You have to have integrity as a spiritual leader. What is it? What is integrity? An impactful spiritual leader is one who has moral standards without hypocrisy. He doesn't just tell people what to do and lead people in a direction. He's in the trenches as well, leading the people. He practices what he preaches. Now, why do I say integrity needs to be added to this list of biblical qualities? The reason why I say that is spiritual integrity is peppered all through all kinds of different passages in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. We read about people like Job. You guys remember him? Not Job. There are some people reading there like, I read about Job this morning. No, Job. Uh, I don't have the number right here with me. Maybe I can share it with you guys tonight. About how many times in the book of Job we read about integrity. Job was a man of inter- integrity. And not only in his life, but in the Old Testament as well, you read about David. Uh, in Psalm 78, verse number 72, we read that David shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. He was a leader. David was a leader. And how was he able to do that? Because he was a man who was upright. Um, so the point is, out of all the necessary requirements of a spiritual leader, I would submit to you guys, the most important is spiritual integrity. True spiritual leaders are ones whose lives are holy. They're blameless. Nobody can bring accusation against them because they're pursuing the Lord. Are they perfect? No. But when they mess up, they're quick to repent and turn back to the Lord. The 1 Timothy 3 uses the word above reproach. Now, why does all this matter for 2 Corinthians? Why do I even, why do I even bring that up? Because this is one of the issues, this is one of the reasons why First and Second Corinthians, the letter we just read, was written. There were people who were attacking the integrity of a spiritual leader, and his name was Paul. So Paul writes First Corinthians, and he writes Second Corinthians, in order to, to share with folks that he's really a man who practices what he preaches. Although their accusations were false, it was still super dangerous within the church. You see, if, if people started to believe these allegations against Paul, then it would hinder God's word from going forth, and Paul's reputation would be destroyed. So here is Paul in 2 Corinthians, and he's between a rock and a hard place. What should he do? When people are making false claims about his life, he could do one of two things. He could defend himself, or he could just let it slide, let it dry up and fall off when they started slinging mud. What would happen if Paul didn't defend himself against all this gossip that was going on throughout this church? Well, the Corinthians might abandon him and start favoring the ones that were gossiping. If, if Paul didn't address the gossip and address the accusations, People might, over time, after they continue to hear it, start believing it. So it's dangerous. Now, what if he did defend himself? What if he did write this letter? What if he did show up and say, hey, let's set the record straight? Then people might start accusing him of being prideful. Now, what, what does he end up doing? Let's pick up in verse number 11. What we're going to see in these next few verses, and the remainder of our time here this morning is six reasons why the Apostle Paul ends up defending himself. He ends up addressing all these accusations. The first reason he ends up defending himself is, is found in verse number 11. 
Bible says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. He is seeking to defend himself, number one, because Paul feared the Lord. You see, whenever the Bible uses this term here, to fear the Lord, understand this isn't a bad thing. This is, this is a healthy thing. It was a good thing that Paul was fearing the Lord. It means to have reverence, to have respect or awe for Him. Paul loved the Lord. He feared the Lord. And he wanted to live a life that was holy in the Lord's sight. And so when people come forward and start saying things that were wrong about, about Paul, it, it tore him up. He wanted people to know that the focus of his life wasn't on making money or, or getting a promotion within the church. Or His focus was on God's will and God's word. That's why he's defending himself. He couldn't stay silent because if he continued to stay silent, his ministry would be rendered useless and ineffective because lies are just being spread everywhere. So he moves forward to defend his ministry with humble reluctancy. He doesn't want people to think he's being prideful. That's the first reason Paul defended his ministry. He feared the Lord. Number two, Paul defended himself. Why? For the sake of the church. The church's reputation was at stake. The health of the church was at stake. Well, let's read verse number 12 together. Hope you still have your Bibles open and your eyes open. Let's look at verse number 12. The Bible says this, We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. You see, these false accusations that were coming forward, if they were left unchecked, could devastate the church. What happened if people started spreading lies about the pastor, and then they were left unchecked? As time went on, people, number one, might start believing the lies, but you might have other people in the church that would defend Paul. So then you start having a group that is faithful to the teaching of the Word, listening and respects your pastor, and then you have this other group who are listening to the false teachers. What's going to happen in that church? Is it going to be unified? Absolutely not. That's what creates splits and tears and within churches. Gossip. It's one of the main roots. Nothing will split a church faster than attacks on the reputation of their leaders. It splits churches all the time. But not only did these lies and this gossip threaten to split the church, it also threatened to, how can I say this, uh, dwarf or stunt the spiritual growth within the church. What do I mean by that? You see, Paul was one of the direct conduits of God's revelation to the church. He would uh, send these letters and, and all of these things. If Paul was taken out from being the leader because of all this a destroyed reputation, then another conduit would come in. But it wouldn't be channeling in the truth of God's Word. It would be like a sewer pipe, <laughs> trash coming into the church from the false teacher. So again, that's why he's defending himself. And then I like what he says there in verse number 12. He, he's really addressing his critics in verse number 12. I don't know if you caught it, but he said, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance. You see that? And then he goes on to say, and not about what is in the heart. His accusers were so worried about the outside, the way things looked on the outside, they didn't care about what was in the corruption. Well, they are the ones that were corrupted within their hearts. All right. So, what have we talked about so far? Paul defended himself because he feared the Lord, but also the reputation and the health of the church was at stake. Number three, as we move on, Paul was also devoted to the truth. He defended himself because he was devoted to the truth. Look at verse 13. It says, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. What does that verse mean there? 
There's a lot of people spreading a lot of gossip about Paul. One of them was that he was out of his mind. That's what that, the language there in verse number 13 means. If we are beside ourselves, Paul was so passionate and he was so devoted to the truth, people thought he was crazy. He was passionate. You know, if we're honest here this morning, if you're here and you're devoted to the truth, you love God's Word, you're pursuing holiness, you know, that's the way the outside world looks at you. Like you're out of your mind. How could you, how could you even say something so radical? That's the way the church was looking at Paul. But it's, he's not the only one. You look back in Scripture at people like John the Baptist, what were they saying about him? That old crazy bearded man eating honey. and I mean, John the Baptist was a bold man. He was a passionate man. People thought he was crazy. In fact, one time, uh, the religious crowd come around John the Baptist, and you know what he said about him? He didn't pull any punches. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 3, verse number 7. He saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, and he said to, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who, war who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So, I mean, he, again, he was, people thought he was out of his mind, but he wasn't. They said about John in Matthew 11, verse number 18, he has a demon. They thought he was crazy. But Paul, here in the same boat, he's defending himself. Though people thought he was crazy, he wasn't. He was just a man of conviction. He was passionate about what he believed. And there's a lot of people today that are in that same boat. You mean you believe marriage is between one man and one woman? You are crazy. You're out of your mind. You, you mean a man shouldn't be enslaved to this and to this and pornography and alcohol and this and that substance. You're crazy. Everybody does it now. You mean a student should wait until they're married in order to enter a relationship with somebody else? You're crazy. That's what they were saying about Paul. And he defended himself not because of for his own sake, but so that he, as we're going to see, so he could continue to minister. Look at, look at verse number 13. It says, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If, if it seems like we're crazy, it's for God. And then he says, If we are in our right mind, it is for you. And so he addresses this. He says, For the Corinthians' sake, a lot of times he's gentle and humble and patient. He says, The reason why I'm like that is for your sake, so you'll continue to grow. All right, if you're still with us mentally here this morning and you haven't checked out, look at verse number 14 for our next point. Another reason why Paul defended himself is because he was thankful. He was thankful for what the Lord had done in his life. Let's read it together. It says, For the love of Christ controls us. What, what love is he talking about here? It says, The love of Christ. Is it Paul's love for Christ or is it for Christ's love for Paul? In this context, you know, I, I did some studying. The love that he's talking about here is best seen in this context as Christ's love for Paul. Because Christ so loved Paul, it controlled him. It motivated him to defend himself. Christ lovingly saved Paul. And he didn't want anything to hinder him in order that he could express his love for the Lord. Now, Let's keep digging in. Look at verse 14. It says, For the love of Christ controls us. What does it mean? What does he mean it controls us? This word literally means a pressure that produces action. God's love for Paul was squeezing him to the point where it's producing him. It was producing action within his life to serve the Lord he was compelled to serve him wholeheartedly because of God's love toward the Apostle Paul. But listen, we've got, to, we've got to remember this in light of the context. If Paul's ministry was discredited by a bunch of loose-lipped church members, what was going to happen? He's going to lose that opportunity to express his love towards the Lord. 
now we're in, we're in something that everybody needs to really tune in. The last part of verses 14 and 15 are, are really important because a lot of people take this out of context. The Bible goes on to say, Because we have concluded this, the one has died for all, therefore all have died. The Bible says, one has died for. Now this is talking about Christ, and this is talking about what we call the atonement. Christ dying in our place. When the Bible uses the word here, for, it literally means in the place of. One has died in the place of, or for, all. Paul's teaching the truth of what we call, and this is a word I'd, if you don't get it written down, it's okay, but you need to at least be hear it. So the shock factor, it's called substitutionary atonement. That's what Paul's teaching here in this verse. And then he goes on to say, this is where people get tripped up, the one has died for all. What's he mean there? Christ died for all. All who would believe in him. Now what do we mean by that? There's a lot of people that get really tripped up on this verse, but I want you guys to know it's, it's very clear, Bible speaking here, in Scripture, we know, and there's no debate about this, Romans 3.23, all have sinned. There's no way we can, we can get by that. Every single person has sinned. And what that means, according to Romans 6.23, is that all deserve the death penalty. Every single one of us. We've all sinned. We all deserve to pay for it. We all deserve the death penalty. But, the Bible goes on to say in Romans 3.22 that Christ's death fully satisfied God's divine wrath. Here's a question. For who? Who, does, who did the atonement, who, who did the death of Christ on the cross, who did it pay for? For whom? Well, the Bible's clear on that as well. Romans chapter 3, verse number 28. Romans chapter 3, verse number 30. Romans chapter 4, verse number 5. And the passage we just read. Look at verse 14 again. One has died for all, therefore all have died. Now, this is where we get, we get in trouble here. A lot of people just take that first phrase and say, One has died for all. If you take that statement alone, that would mean... That Christ died for every person that has lived. Now wait a second. Let's read the rest of it. It goes on to say, Therefore all have died. He's not talking about a condition at this point. He's talking about an event. The last part of that verse, whenever it says, Therefore all have died, he's talking about a believer's union with Christ. Death to sin, death to self, so that helps us answer the who question. But let's flesh it out a little bit more. Maybe, maybe you missed it. A lot of people will say whenever they read this verse, well, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10 says that God's the Savior of all men. It does say that. It's exactly right. And that's true in a temporal, physical sense. God's the Savior of all men in the sense that when we commit our first sin, He doesn't just issue us right to hell. That's what we call common grace. We're still, even though we've sinned, we're still able to breathe. We're still able to eat a sandwich. We're still able to experience sunlight. That's common grace that's extended to all men. God is a Savior of all men temporarily, physically, but He is, the Bible goes on to say, Take the rest of that verse. He is especially the Savior of believers, eternally and spiritually. The atonement, what we're reading about here in this verse, is only substitutionary for those who by grace, through faith, have died in Christ. Here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. If Christ died, listen guys, 
If Christ died as a substitute for the whole human race, do you know what that means? Everybody's going to heaven, right? God's wrath's been satisfied for everybody. Divine judgment, divine judgment, justice is satisfied. Well, clearly that's not the case because there's people every second dying and going to hell. So what's this mean here? Christ died, and the ones that are saved are who? Who by faith trust in Him to be saved. So what's this have to do with Paul? Why is he bringing this up? Why is he bringing up the atonement at this point? Because he's thankful. He wants to continue to keep preaching the truth of the gospel. That Christ has provided a way, but not everybody's going to turn to Him in faith. Not a bunch of robots. He knows that if his ministry is discredited, he's not going to get those opportunities like he once ha had. He's defending his ministry so he could continue to show gratitude, which moves on to point number five. Paul lived for Christ. Why did he defend himself? Because his life was all about Christ. Look at verse 15. It says, And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. Now that's an important truth that we need to understand here this morning. That when we have been saved, we no longer live for ourselves. Which is true in the case of the Apostle Paul. And should be the case in every single born-again believer's life. Your life as a believer isn't about you. It's about Him and them. Now, how do we know Paul lived for Christ and not himself? Acts chapter 20, verse number 24 says this, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. That's pretty clear. But it goes on to say, So that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly to the gospel of the grace of God. Romans 14, 8. These are helpful verses to, to adopt as our motto in life. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Philippians 1.21 For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Paul's life was like a sponge. It just been saturated with Christ. You bumped into Him. You squeezed Him. Persecution life will come out. It was Christ. And here are fools in Corinth trying to discredit his ministry. It would have, de it would have devastated Paul. All right, I want to move on to our last point. Number six. The last reason why Paul's defending himself here against a church full of gossips was because he was burdened for the lost. The main reason he wanted his ministry to continue, to continue and for integrity to be there was because he wanted to see people saved. He, I don't think we understand Paul's desire for people to be saved. Like, it was the, to the point in his life that he desired people to be saved. It was so intense that he was, if it was possible, which it's not, to forfeit his own, he would have given it up so other people could be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse number 1. He says his constant desire and prayer to God was for them, for their salvation. All right, look at verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. What, what is this? Like, What does this verse even mean here? Verse 16, the Apostle Paul's pointing back to verses 14 and 15. He's saying here that, there was a point in his life where he looked at people wrongly, like these gossips were. He looked at Christ the wrong way as a persecutor of the church, and he looked at people the wrong way. But something happened in his life where the Lord radically saved him, gave him a new nature, and the way he looked at Christ changed, and the way he looked at people changed as well. That's what, that's what verse number 16 means. And then our, our last verse here, verse 17 which I'm sure all of you guys have heard before, says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I like what he says there. 
if anyone. God's grace and mercy are so wide, it's, it's able to encompass even the most vile, wicked sinners. If anyone is in Christ. We start sharing testimonies this morning about our life prior to Christ. We fall under that anyone. What did we used to do? If anyone is in Christ. And then he says, he uses the language in verse number 17, a new creature. What does that mean? There's a lot of new things in the world right now. But when he uses this word new, he's talking about quality, not in sequence. Like the next new thing, it's not necessarily good. When Christ says a new creature, it's, it's a quality newness. And he says this, the old things have passed away. When Paul came to Christ, something happened in his life. All the old ideas he had, all the old plans that he had, all the old uh, desires, all his old beliefs vanished. He was new. They're replaced with what? The old things are replaced with new things. New things that you're going to have to go out and get. New things that accompany salvation that's imparted to him. And he says this, the new things have come. The moment he was saved, that was a past action with continuous effects. New things have come when he was saved. God planted inside of Paul new desires, new truths, new uh, loves and new desires. All right, so we've kind of in a brief way went through those verses, but now we need to explain what this has to do with our application here this morning. I want you guys to see, walking away, is that the Apostle Paul in these verses is defending his ministry. He's doing that for good reasons. He's a man of integrity. He's doing it because he wanted to keep preaching the gospel. He's doing it because he's grateful that God had saved him. He's also super thankful which led to a concern for the church. He's defending himself because he didn't want the church to shrivel up or for trash to be pipelined pop into the pulpit. He's devoted to the truth. He desired the lost to be saved. So understand this. When you are looking for a spiritual leader, maybe you're here this morning and you are a single woman and you are looking to get married one day, as God allows that's an essential quality that you should look at in a future husband. It's integrity. That's great if he can give you direction, but you need someone that's going to practice what they preach. And a pastor, and a dad, in all of these areas, we need to understand the most admirable quality is spiritual integrity. Paul had it, but here's the problem. Others didn't. And because others didn't have spiritual integrity, they were spreading lies about Paul in the church. Things that just simply weren't true. And so what ends up happening, and what we're seeing played out here in Scripture, is that Paul has to go to those people who do not have spiritual integrity. He has to confront them. Confidently challenge the Corinthians. Listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians 4. Verse number 5, he said, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring both the light, the things hidden in the darkness, and disclose the motive of, of men's heart. And then each man, man's praise will come to him from God. They're trying to weigh out Paul. <laughs> he says that's the Lord's job, not you helpful way I think this would impact our church family this morning is to honestly understand that Paul would not even have to be dealing with this if there was not loose lips within the church. A healthy, growing church, and if a church desires to be growing, cannot be marked by gossip. Amen? Do we believe that? Do we desire to continue to grow? What this means is that if you are speaking about someone else, 
and it's not edifying, it's not building someone else up. If you are speaking about somebody else outside of their presence, and it's changing someone else's opinion on them, that's gossip. And that's a sin. And it devastated the Corinthian church, and it devastates churches every single day. When you go home and you talk about your Sunday school teacher, man, they really didn't. Did you see how long they went today? Or whenever you talk about different individuals, did you see what, did you see what she said to her kids? <laughs> how d- All of these different ways that we're tempted to gossip or to change other people's opinion. We may not even realize we're doing it. But when we open our mouth, it has the potential to build someone up or tear them down or to change someone else's opinion on them. And we may not even have the facts straight ourselves or their facts that aren't ours to share. That's gossip. Maybe you're in a situation where you have been talking about somebody else and it has changed people's opinions. Or maybe you have an issue with somebody else and all you do is just open that pipeline for diarrhea of the mouth to come out. I would challenge you, if you have an issue with somebody else, don't go tell someone else. Be a man or be a godly woman and go to that person. Don't. Don't be a coward. You have a problem with somebody else and you go to them and you speak to them. If you have a problem with somebody else and you're not willing to go to them and speak to them, then you need to keep your mouth shut because it is at the expense of the health of the local church. Something else that we need to apply, I believe would be helpful this morning, especially in my own heart, is to think better about your brothers and your sisters in Christ. Our minds in the world that teach us to be so negative towards other people. What happens many times is what we're hearing most of the time isn't true. So when someone comes to you and begins to open the, the pipeline, just shut them down. Say, unless you're going to go to them and address these issues, I don't want to hear it. It would be helpful if people would do that within the local church. I, I just don't want to hear it. It's going to cause them to step back and be like, oh, can't talk to them anymore about this. And maybe if enough people would do that, it would squelch it out. Think better about your fellow man. If it seems like it's a legitimate concern, then go to him. Don't get diarrhea of the mouth. So this is God's gracious way this morning as a pastor for me to deal with the gossip in the church. And, you know, different situations arise at different points, but I'm thankful that we're able to go through God's Word. And what we're able to do is I'm able to, I'm able to, to preach this and volley it to you guys, and then it's up to you to either respond in faith and say, yeah, I'm, it's, that's what God's Word says. Let's move forward in grace and forgiveness and allow the church to become healthy. Because what eventually happens is when the church doesn't do that, then the, the pastor has to deal with it in other ways. And many times people become embarrassed. It's just, it is what it is. But I think it would just be more helpful this morning if people would hear, hey, don't gossip. We just don't. Hear it, receive it, grow, and let's keep plowing for the glory of the Lord. Let me pray for us. God, you are so gracious and kind and given us uh, this passage this morning. I pray that if there is any gossiping going on within this church, within the community, we would, uh, we would shut it down. <laughs> that your word would have shut it down right now and that we would continue to grow. Uh, Lord, help us to understand the topic. It's not even a topic. The doctrine of the atonement that you have died for anyone 
who will believe in you. And Lord, that is such, uh, such a display of your grace that even that we were able to continue to live even after our first sin. Lord, even the doctrine of hell, even knowing about hell, is a display of your grace. I pray in this invitation that you would continue to work in hearts and that for the sake of the glory of your Son, uh, you would allow us to apply it through your Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.